Okay, so settle down. Listen carefully. One, two, three, eyes on me. Something that happens to you in this conference in the next two days is going to change your life. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to happen. You might not even know that it happened until you're back home and two or three months later, something is you're going to connect and you're going to, oh, that's what I'm going to do. I know this like I know how old I am. Something that happens to you in this summit is going to change your life. And by the way, I know exactly how old I am. I thought growing older would take a lot longer, <laughs> you know? But I notice that people my age are so much older than I am, you know, so that's, that's helpful. One of my retired friends, uh, where are all my retired friends? All right, in the house, in the house. We're so, uh, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, and I want us all to give it up for the giants whose shoulders we are all standing on. One of my retired friends said, I know it seems like as you get older, you get grumpier. It's not true. You just get more like yourself. Okay, which um, maybe explains what's happening to me because I've been in a bad mood for about a year now. You know what I'm talking about? So I keep throwing things at the TV, you know, and my, my little sister says I need anger management classes. <laughs> I don't need anger management classes. I need Donald Trump to stop p ticking me off. So let me be honest with you, because at this leadership summit, I need something to change my life. Because I'm an emotional person on any given day. Um, but I'm starting to get a little too much like myself. Uh, I have been hit with more emotions this year, anger, grief, bitterness, denial. Uh, by the way, later on uh, in the evening, there will be a reception, and we've purchased Prozac salt licks for the different tables, which I know that you'll enjoy. So let me just tell you, I need to find a way to take all of these raw emotions because I do not want anyone to control me. I want to be in charge of myself. And I want to use the energy that's coming from all of those emotions so that we can actually move ahead to something better. So I am here to learn. And I might not even know what I need to know until it's right there in front of me and something connects in my head. This is a leadership summit um, you are not here so that we can make a leader out of you. There is no one in this room who has not already demonstrated remarkable leadership. We did not pull your name out of a hat. You know that. Uh, you impressed somebody. Uh, somebody in this room told you you should be in this room. Uh, you came. And some of you walked into this room going, I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen. And you came anyway. You came anyway. You showed up. And that means you are open to whatever might happen. There's some research that is going to thread through this experience that you're about to have. The most successful leaders in our union, we studied them. And they all, as different as they come, they all have certain competencies, certain skills in common. They are advocates to their souls, right down to their underwear. They're going to advocate. They see something that needs to be done, something that's not fair, something uh, that their members or their students don't have, and they're going to go out and they're going to fight for it. They understand that they've got a stewardship role, that our members have entrusted them with resources so that uh, we'll have something uh, that we can use to make things better. They have to have a good business sense 
that respects that trust. They know how to communicate. They know how to explain something complex in ways that command attention. People listen to them. People learn from them. They know how to bring people together when it's time to make a decision, and we want to have a fair decision. We call it governance and leadership. They know how to work within the rules that people trust, and when necessary, they know how to change those rules. And the whole goal is to make sure we have honest conversations, that we exchange ideas, that we make decisions that make sense, and that we move forward. And they are professionals. People trust that they know what they're doing. They demand respect for their professional voice. They know how to organize. They do it in their sleep. They take all that's in them, the advocacy, the professionalism, the communication skills. They take all those competencies and they organize people and resources and projects and communities so that something gets done that needed to get done. I know, thank you, Utah. <laughs> yes. I love them, I love them. You know, I'm hoping anyway that as I went through these competencies that you recognized yourself in there. And maybe you recognize some of your talents more in some than in others, but it's all in here. And what we want you to do in these couple of days that, that we're all locked together in this little community, we want you to be more conscious about your own skills, the ones that you have as naturally as you breathe. You don't even pay attention to it because it's just the way you show up. But we also want you to think about maybe something that um, you could use to exercise, like a, like a muscle that needs to be exercised. Think of this as yoga leadership. Okay, yes, we'll do something. Namaste, I can't do it. So, st let the stretching begin. Think of a time. Think of a time when you were called on to lead. Better yet, think of a time when nobody called on you to lead and you just couldn't help yourself. You just jump right in. <laughs> and people are like, oh, what, where did this person come from? You know, if you start to unpack a real situation where you showed some leadership, um, you're going to find examples of all those competencies in how you handled that situation. Our folks that are pulling uh, this summit together, and let's hear it let's, uh, for all the planning committee, the staff, oh my gosh. You know, the logistics of getting, you know, over 2,000 of your best friends in the same room is, is really fun. Um, they're the ones that ordered the Prozac salt licks, of course, but, you know, they asked me, they said, if you're going to, said, Lily, if you're going to ask people to think about something in their experience of leadership, uh, we want you to share something. And I started thinking, and I went, oh, that would be Mr. Rasmussen. Alan Rasmussen taught fourth grade next door to me at Orchard Elementary School in 1980, none of your business, <laughs> when, uh, when I first started teaching. And I was not elected anything. The only thing that qualified me as a leader was that I had a big mouth and a lot of opinions. I was actually overqualified. Um, and Alan was my mentor just because he was next door to me. That's the way we picked mentors. It was the person that you went uh, when something wasn't working. Um, and he was patient and professional and wonderful. And he was a very, very busy man inside the classroom and outside the classroom. He was the father of five children, all boys. Elementary teachers, all boys. Okay, we know what that means. His wife, Laura, did not work outside the home because she was a full-time, very hard-working stay-home mom. But luckily, Mr. Rasmussen, of course, brought home one of those big, fat, juicy Utah teacher paychecks. <laughs> so, of course, they were living the high life. Um, his son, Danny, was five years old. He had just started kindergarten, so they only had their two-year-old left at home, and they were already counting the days to when he would get to kindergarten, and they could, you know, like have that, uh, that house back to themselves and, and get on with their lives. And one day, Alan shows up at the uh, staff break room, and he says, Danny has cancer. 
leukemia. And we all had a good cry. And we all say what uh, people say. And we said, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. And he said, pray. All we can do is pray. So Danny starts treatment. And chemo is pretty tough on anybody, on a little five-year-old body. That was tough. Alan and Laura both wanted to just hold him. Um, and Alan goes through the five days of family sick leave in our contract pretty fast. And it was really tough for him not to be with Danny and with his family uh, the way he really should have been. Months go by. He's missing days at work. The district's docking his pay for the substitute. And finally, he says, the only thing that's going to save Danny is a bone marrow transplant. Um, it's an excruciatingly painful process on both the donor and the recipient. The good news, they find the perfect match. The bad news, it's the two-year-old. Danny has to be strong enough to withstand the treatment. So everything's on hold. He's on a waiting list to get to a hospital in California. They're waiting for his blood count to get to a certain level, and as soon as it is, the doctor says, you have to run to the airport, get on a plane, and head for California. And then the two boys will be able to start the treatment. The district says Alan can't go because he's missed too many days. And they've started to dock his paycheck not at the substitute rate, but at his daily rate. So they're paying the substitute, docking his daily rate. They're making money off of this family's misery. And Alan's just tired. He just wants to be with his little boy. He's already grieving. And he's my friend. And I'm going to do something about it. I advocated for him by sermonizing with our colleagues about how crappy the district was treating him. And that was fun. And then some of my friends at third lunch started talking about their five days of family sick leave. Some of them didn't have spouses, didn't have kids. They never used them. They said uh, in a very business competent way, you know, the district budgets for all of our family sick leave. Too bad we can't just donate our family sick leave to Alan. And I said, why the heck not? And I didn't say heck. I said, we could organize that. And we all voted then and there at third lunch that we were going to donate our sick leave. Like we were elected governance, which we absolutely were not and had no authority to do that. Luckily, we did not care. Um, I typed up a petition on a very special machine called a typewriter. <laughs> And when I made a mistake, I took a little bottle of white paint called White Out. I'll be explaining those historic terms to our millennials later in the program. You could sign this petition if you wanted to volunteer your family sick leave to Alan. And I went from class to class, and I communicated with my colleagues why they should sign that petition and what would the rest of us would think of them if they didn't, which makes you very popular. <laughs> and 36 out of 38 people at Orchard Elementary signed that petition. And I called the superintendent's office, and I asked him for an appointment. And I had a plan for a little group of us to go and make the case to the superintendent directly that we were professionals and we needed to be able to care for our own sons and daughters as well as our students. And I got an appointment for the following week and Danny died that weekend. So, when I was asked by our wonderful NEA folks to share with you an experience that showed leadership. I immediately thought of Mr. Rasmussen. I thought of Danny. Because I have such mixed feelings about my leadership in that story. Because I took all those emotions, all that indignation, and I just kind of went off on my own. I'm always right. It's a curse, you know? 
But I decided I was going to write that petition. I stared down my colleagues. I said, I need you to sign this. And you know, after Danny died, we all cried. We went to the funeral. I stopped doing what I was doing. I was worried about my friend Alan. Do you know, he wasn't going to be the last one of us with a sick child. It never occurred to me to keep that appointment with the superintendent. It never occurred to me to pick up the phone and talk to my Granite Education Association and see what we could do to change a contract policy that left a family so helpless who was just wanting to be with the dying child. I have a big mouth and a lot of opinions. And there were real gaps in my leadership. I had a lot to learn. I was out there by myself, fired up, ready to do something. And I think I would have done things a lot differently uh, to help Alan and his family today. Anyway, I don't think I did anything wrong. And I know Alan appreciated his colleagues sticking up for him. Um, I know he appreciated that till the day he died last year as a, a retired, uh, wonderful human being. The story of leadership here is not so much about me. It's about Alan. Alan picked himself up from his grief and got more involved. He became my local president. He punished me by putting me on the bargaining committee <laughs> in a non-bargaining state. That is not for cowards. He encouraged me to run for state president. He encouraged me to run for U.S. Congress. He encouraged me to run, because that didn't work out so hot, but <laughs> he encouraged me to run for this thing called the NEA Executive Committee. He's why I'm here, because this quiet, gentle, elementary teacher, this professional to his core, this dad who adored his boys, lived a life of purpose and pride and tenderness and determination. I'm not sure there's anything more tragic than losing a child. But he drew strength from all the love that other people gave to him, and he used that strength in his leadership to lift up others, to lift me up, and I'm just one of a long line. He used it to lift up our professionalism and respect, yes, respect our families as well. He's the one that convinced the district to improve family sick leave, and it wasn't for him. It was because something tragic in his life touched him, and he decided to use his leadership to make something better for somebody else. The leadership of those around me has always inspired me. With all the darkness that surrounds us these days, have you noticed that you're seeing some lights flashing? Have you noticed? <laughs> Look at the women who work in vulnerable positions, whose jobs sometimes depend on them being silent about harassment, about abuse, and look at the leaders amongst them who are staring down their abusers and saying, time's up. <laughs> look at West Virginia. Oh, give it up for West Virginia. Where, have we got West Virginia in the house here? Have we got West Virginia? Wow. Everybody started standing up. I thought we had all of West Virginia in the house. Some of the most unappreciated, underpaid educators in the country decided they would stand up to those powerful politicians. And the leaders in West Virginia made that powerful case that professional pay is actually important to attracting and keeping quality <laughs> teachers and education support professionals. And they won.
and look at our students. <laughs> Starting in Florida, but from sea to shining sea. Did you see those students? They were holding press conferences. They were the ones speaking out. They were telling their stories and saying, no more gun violence. I'm not sure there is um, anyone more fearless than uh, teenagers who know they're right. These young people are not going away. These young people are woke. They are woke. I learn something from leaders around me every day, from so many of you in this room. And you'll learn something from those strange people that are sitting around you, even at this moment. Look to your right, look to your left, yes. I'm talking about you. <laughs> You're going to see something that happens. You're going to see it with new eyes. You're going to see something that inspires you. And it might be, you know, like someone sitting next to you right here at the bar, hmm, um, <laughs> where you'll just be talking and someone's going to say something absolutely brilliant and you're going to go, oh my gosh, that is so true. And you're going to have another drink and then... <laughs> you're going to start saying, uh, that means something to me. That connects. That's my moment. That's something that changed my life. That is the power and the promise of this summit. This framework that, that I just went through, it, yes, it's about being more aware of your own talents, but it's intentionally taking your personal leadership to the next level. This, this is not free. Look, look, this is not free. They, they have me with a microphone right here. I don't know what this costs. It's really fun. I'm taking it home. But <laughs> this is our investment in you. It's not a cost. It's an investment in you. You are the next generation of leaders. You are the people who will grow, will strengthen, will transform this union. And I'm not just talking about the 20-somethings. I'm talking about our retirees. I'm talking about everybody in that continuum. You are the next generation. You are the center of the universe at this summit. Be wide open to that something that's about to change your life, that's about to change the way you see your own leadership. Be open to taking a leap of faith to the next level. And thank you, mil gracias, hermanos y hermanas, for your fearlessness in not being afraid to fly. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs>